Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Apologies for the very long space between videos. It uh, was not planned and as you can see, I'm not in Japan. I'm in a very Canadian looking house. <laughs> it's because I'm in Canada at the moment. I'm gonna be here for a little while. Um, I thought about whether or not I wanted to make this video. I wasn't too sure because it's pretty personal and I thought maybe I could just pretend like the last couple of months didn't happen and <laughs> get back into vlogging when I was ready and not address it. But the past three months have just been an absolute shit show and the only things that helped me get through it mentally were watching vlogs of people that went through the same thing or were going through the same thing and it really helped me out. Like I cannot explain how much of a comfort it was to see somebody who was going through the same thing um, and handling it okay and just uh, getting some idea of what it was gonna be like for me. But anyways, let me explain what the heck I'm talking about. So as you guys know, I just moved apartments in Japan. I moved to a new city. I'm based in Sendai now. I had just moved into my new apartment in July and I was there for five days before all of this happened. And that was such a good five days. I've got Maro back and I really like my new apartment and I was just so thrilled to be there in a new city and really excited about making videos for you guys. And I talked a lot about <laughs> wanting to make videos in Sendai for you. And I'm sure you're all wondering why the heck I haven't uploaded anything. Well, yeah, five days after I moved in, I started having troubles speaking. It, I'm still having problems now. You can probably tell my voice is a little messed up, but it, it's really hard to explain. It kind of just felt like I had to really put a lot of effort into speaking and I felt really exhausted after trying to talk for more than a couple minutes at a time. And I was also having problems swallowing and breathing at times. So I found a clinic nearby my new apartment and um, I popped in there and I asked them to just take a look at my throat, <laughs> see if there's anything weird going on there. And they took some blood tests. My blood tests were all normal, so I wasn't too worried. And then I went in for an ultrasound, which is just, um, it's not painful. It's just to see the inside of your throat and see what's going on. And there's an ultrasound technician that looks at a screen and will um, record that information and pass it on to the doctor. The technician doesn't normally tell you anything because it's not their place to do so. As she was like scanning my throat, she was taking so many pictures of this one location. And she said, is this the first time you're having this looked at? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> first time, just started having troubles with it um, these past couple weeks and it just got so bad today that I thought I really should go in and get it checked out. She was like, okay, well, the doctor is gonna talk to you about this. <laughs> and I was just like, ah, oh, that doesn't sound good. I started to get a little nervous. I went back out to the waiting room and uh, I sat there for about 20 minutes and the doctor called me in and sat me down and right away he was like, you have a giant tumor on your thyroid. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Didn't see that coming. I really, I didn't know what to expect, but I think I had maybe expected something more along the lines of maybe your thyroid is swollen or irritated or like enlarged. I didn't expect to hear that it had a tumor. And then he followed that up with, and there is a 95% chance that it's cancer. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was not prepared to hear this today. I had not mentally prepared to hear that I have a large cancerous tumor in my neck today. So I don't know. I was just shocked. It's hard to explain how I felt. I was terrified. And the worst part is he didn't really tell me much else. He said, we'll have to do some more follow-up tests on it to see what's going on. But 
um, my clinic is very busy so I can't get you in for another three months. <laughs> I, was like, uh, I really can't sit on this information for three months. Like that's probably the some of the worst news I could have heard from you and now I'm supposed to just act like normal and go about my life for three months wondering what the heck is going on and if I'm going to be okay and that was just to do some more follow-up testing so it just felt like this was going to be such a long process and I, I really wasn't comfortable with that so I left the clinic and I did some research on thyroid specialists in Japan and I phoned up a bunch of them. Before, before I did this, I had to quickly teach myself all these Japanese words to do with thyroid and thyroid conditions and tumors and cancer. All of this vocabulary was brand new to me because I had never had to use these words in Japanese before. So I did that and I kind of prepared myself to talk about it in Japanese. And then I called up all the hospitals that I could find and every single one told me the same thing. They're full and the soonest they can get me in is probably three or four months down the line. So I talked to my family and uh, I asked them to do some research to see what they could find in Canada. I didn't really have any luck finding anything in Canada either. There wasn't really much information online and I didn't really feel comfortable making a trip all the way to Canada to see a doctor if I couldn't learn something about them online beforehand to make sure it's a reputable place and you know it has good reviews. So we kept looking and I think about maybe a week later my dad found a place in Florida of all places that had amazing reviews online. It was a center that specializes in thyroid disease and thyroid cancer and surgery of the removal of tumors and thyroid glands. So all they did was thyroid stuff and the reviews on Google were just stellar. Like everybody said that they just had the best care when they went there. There were even people that said other doctors had told them their cancer was terminal and they went to this hospital in Florida and they were able to cure it. <laughs> so everything just sounded really great about this hospital. And even though Florida is probably, you know, one of the last places that I want to travel right now with COVID and everything, uh, I figured it was worth it. So I contacted uh, the hospital and I put in like a um, patient request form with all my information and I uploaded my uh, ultrasound files and stuff so that the surgeon could check them out <coughs> excuse me and then I just waited to hear back from them and this was like the most excruciating I want to say it was probably about 10 days of my life just wondering if I would hear back from them if they would accept me as a patient like I'm sure it's a pain in the ass for them to have to deal with somebody who's located on the other side of the world it would be much easier if they could just take somebody in America I'm sure but um, then I got a call one day at 3 a.m. <laughs> in Japan time and uh, the lady was like, uh, good evening Charlotte. I was like, oh, it's actually 3 a.m. here, but hey, <laughs> thanks for calling. And it was the surgeon, the surgeon herself called me up and um, she wanted to talk to me and ask me some questions about how I was feeling and uh, she would give me a recommendation as to whether or not she thinks I should have surgery to remove the tumor or yeah, just how I should go about it. From looking at my scans and from talking to me about my symptoms, etc., uh, the surgeon told me there's about a 50-50 chance that it's cancer and she won't know until she removes the tumor and they're able to send it off to a lab and examine it thoroughly. That was kind of a relief to me because the doctor in Japan told me 95% chance. So hearing 50-50 from the American surgeon kind of put my nerves like at rest a little bit. I felt a little happier with those odds, even though they still kind of suck. And in the end, we decided together that it would be best to remove it. And she said they could get me in in two weeks to do the surgery. And I told her I might need a little bit longer than that because traveling overseas is a bit of a process right now as we learned with the Morrow situation. 
So I booked my surgery for a little further in advance to give me enough time to get all my vaccine documents translated and to book flights and hotels and there was lots involved. Luckily, all of that prep went smoothly and um, I took a flight to Canada and I thought I would spend a week with my family before heading down to Florida just so that I could enjoy some time with them without having to recover from surgery. And then I flew down to Florida. It took three flights from my hometown. I had to go Victoria, Vancouver, Toronto, Florida. So I think I took a total of eight planes last week. <laughs> eight different flights. I'm so sick of planes, so sick of flying, but made it to Florida. It was hot as fuck there and really humid. I didn't know what to expect. You hear so many bad things about Florida online but every single person that I talked to there was so nice. Uh, I have nothing but good things to say about the people of Florida. <laughs> so thank you for your hospitality. The taxi drivers were awesome. And the hotel I stayed at, yeah, they were all really cool. I was there for two days before my appointment just to get settled in. And uh, the day of my surgery, I woke up at 5 a.m. I decided to walk to the hospital because I didn't know if I could trust the taxi to show up on time and I didn't want to be late. It was only about a 40 minute walk or so, so it wasn't too bad. And when I got to the hospital, there was a really pretty rainbow outside. <laughs> yeah, it just felt like a good sign. Everything's gonna go fine today. I was nervous as hell. I was so nervous. So I got signed in at the hospital and they brought me into um, my little room, I had a private room there. They did a whole bunch of blood tests on me to check my thyroid hormone levels and some more thorough ultrasounds. Apparently they have some really high tech ultrasound machines there. So they checked my thyroid and they also checked all the lymph nodes in my neck and under my chin area to look for signs of abnormalities in my lymph nodes because the first place that thyroid cancer will spread to is your lymph nodes. So they did a really thorough ultrasound of my whole neck and they told me they didn't see anything abnormal there. So that was really good. If it was cancer, it appears that it is all contained to my thyroid and it hasn't spread anywhere yet from what they could see. After my ultrasound scans, um, the nurse brought me back to my room and she told me to remove all my clothes and put on these special socks that she gave me and just wait on the bed for the surgeon to come in and do like one final examination before the surgery. And I was like, oh, so just completely naked except for the socks. And she's like, yeah, completely naked, put the socks on and just wait for the surgeon. <laughs> so I take off all of my clothes. I put on these ridiculous yellow socks and I'm just sitting on the bed naked waiting for the surgeon to come in. And she, she comes in and she's like, why are you naked? Did they not give you a gown? And I was like, no, she told me to take all my clothes off and wait for you. And she's like, no, that's no, you put your gown on here, have a gown. And she gave me a gown. It was really embarrassing. Um, but the surgeon was so cool. A uh, really, really nice woman, just hilarious. And uh, she took a look at my neck um, you could see the tumor. I don't know why I hadn't noticed it sooner. I, the first doctor in Japan made me feel so stupid for not coming in sooner. It was like, why didn't you notice this? It's huge. <laughs> How are you not noticing this until now? And now like looking back at the footage of it before my surgery, yeah, it's very obvious, but like, I guess you don't look at your neck like that? I don't know. It, it was kind of like under my under my chin area and you really only notice it when you're swallowing and looking at it. So I don't know, all these years that it's probably been in there and I didn't notice it. They told me that it's about the size of a mandarin orange. <laughs> it's just so weird to me. Um, but the surgeon asked me to stand up and she'd made little markings on my neck of where she would do the incision. I told her not to worry too much about what it looks like. I really don't care. I told her to just do her job. Um, I'm only worried about my health. I don't care how it looks. 
aesthetically. If I have a big scar there, so be it. It'll probably look cool, whatever. And she was like, no, I care how it looks. I'm going to position it in a place so that it's in like a fold, a wrinkle in your neck so that it won't be too obvious once it heals. My sister was with me, by the way, can't thank her enough. I would not have been able to go through this whole thing alone. It would have been hell. So it was so nice to have her there um, just through the whole thing. She helped me feel not as nervous and uh, she was really, really helpful, like asking the nurses questions that I might have forgotten and preparing everything and looking up info for taxis and stuff. Um, yeah, I owe her so much. Thank you, Shay, you're amazing. I've had one, two, three surgeries where I had to go under general anesthetic. So I have experience with it before, but it still kind of freaks me out. I don't know, there's always the risk that you'll die or <laughs> you'll not go to sleep properly and you'll be awake during your surgery or something horrible like that. I don't know, you, you hear these horror stories. So I was a little nervous, but I felt really grateful that I was able to make the trip to America to see this specialist. So overall, I was pretty happy to be there. And then they wheeled me into the surgery room and uh, <laughs> the nurses there were all super nice. One of the nurses came over, she said, it's party time, here's your party hat. She put on a hairnet and now it's time for cocktails. <laughs> and I guess she plugged in the anesthetic and that's the last thing I remember. And then I woke up, which felt like a second later, and uh, I was lying in bed and there was a male nurse uh, trying to wake me up. <laughs> and you could tell that he was getting a little like fed up with waiting for me to wake up. And all I remember him saying was, God, we've been trying to wake you up for ages. You just, you just wouldn't wake up. <laughs> and I was just so groggy at that point. I was so confused. There was another patient like on the other side of the room screaming. And um, yeah, he was thrilled to finally see me opening my eyes. <laughs> they wheeled me back into my, my private room and the nurse came in to see me and she asked me how I was feeling. I said, um, I wasn't really in any pain or anything. I was able to talk okay. That's one of the risks of thyroid surgery is that they can uh, damage your vocal cords in the process and some people lose their voice or have their voice damaged permanently. It was kind of a relief to wake up and try talking and have it work okay. <laughs> My voice was a little raspier than usual, but yeah, I could talk all right. And the nurse asked how I was feeling. I said, you know, I wasn't in any, in much pain or anything. I just felt really nauseous. I get nauseous really easily. And she was like, okay, let's go over to the bathroom. And I made it like two steps that I puked all over her. It's horrible. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. <laughs> um, I'm sure they're used to it, but I felt really bad. Everybody was so nice and I just felt so bad to puke on her. The surgeon told me that the surgery went very well. They removed the tumor. They also removed two of my lymph nodes that are located behind the thyroid, I believe, because those are the first lymph nodes that the cancer will spread to. So they wanted to remove those and have those sent off to the lab for testing to make sure that nothing had spread. And I would be getting those results in about a week or so, they would phone me. I was actually able to go back to my hotel in Florida like right away. I think I woke up from surgery and maybe an hour later. I don't know if time was processing properly for me, but it felt like maybe an hour after surgery, I was already heading back to my hotel. I was able to eat properly, which was cool. I thought after having surgery on my throat, I wouldn't be able to eat or it would be extremely painful or something, but yeah, it felt like normal. I was able to drink and eat solid foods and there were no issues there at all. And I felt really good the first day, but then <laughs> when I woke up in the morning from the second day, I felt like I was hit by a bus or something. My lungs were so painful. This whole like chest area was really painful. And I wasn't expecting that. I thought my neck was gonna kill me, but I didn't even notice that. And I was coughing up blood. It was just a mess. <laughs> my sister contacted the nurse and was like, she's coughing up blood, is that okay? 
and they said it's a normal thing that happens after surgery because while you're asleep they put a breathing tube into your lungs so you can breathe under anesthetic um, and sometimes that will cause irritation and you'll be coughing up some stuff for a few days after your surgery so yeah the hardest part was really just the pain in my lungs and getting up and walking around was so hard <laughs> it's really really painful but Honestly, that's my fault because I decided not to take the prescription pain meds that they uh, prescribed for me. They sounded really strong and scary and I was like, eh, I'll be fine. <laughs> but yeah, I was in a lot of pain for about five days, I wanna say. And then it started to get a little better each day and I could like see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's been about a week and a half now. And I would say, the pain is probably about 90% gone. It still hurts when I move my neck. This is about the full range of motion I have. I can't look over, I can't like look behind um, and I can't tilt my head back. But in general, I feel good, no pain in my body or anything anymore. It's just a little awkward to sleep and I have to be careful when I'm like looking around not to turn my head too much. Yeah, so after resting in Florida for two more nights, I think, two or three more nights, um, we took our flight back to Canada, three flights back to Canada, and I've just been at home resting with my family. It's been really good to see them, even though this whole trip just happened out of nowhere and I wasn't planning on seeing anybody. Of course, it's really nice to be back here with my family. After a very long one week wait, a couple days ago, I heard back from the hospital, they had my lab results and the tumor came back non-cancerous. It was just a really big random ass tumor that wasn't cancer. They tested my lymph nodes, they tested the tumor and they didn't find anything. So they told me, yeah, I'm good to go. I only have half a thyroid left now and hopefully the other half that wasn't uh, destroyed by the tumor will be able to function on its own and produce the hormones that my body needs to survive. You need your thyroid. So if it can't handle producing those hormones on its own, I will need to take some hormonal supplements uh, to make up for that. But um, the surgeon said there is a chance that it'll be okay. And she's actually confident that it will be okay because the right side of my thyroid had been just taken over by the tumor and it wasn't working anyways. So the left side of my thyroid had been doing all the work for who knows how long now. It could have been years really and my thyroid hormone levels were perfect. So yeah, there's a chance I might not need medication but it's kind of hard to tell. In a couple of months I have to go for a checkup at a doctor um, in Japan and just see if all my levels are okay and hopefully it is because I've heard that it can be really tough trying to balance your thyroid hormones out with medication. It can be a bit of a struggle getting the right balance because everybody's different. So fingers crossed. So if any of you guys out there happen to be going through something similar, honestly thyroid problems are so much more common than I had any idea about. I had no idea. After doing lots of research and watching hundreds of vlogs of people going through something similar, it really made me realize how common it is. So I wouldn't be surprised if one of you is going through something similar. If you want to ask me any questions about my surgery or um, yeah, just anything, anything I can help share with you about this experience, leave some comments for me. I would be very happy to help you out. But yeah, that's where we are. Do you want to see my sick scar? It looks kind of gross because it's not healed yet. So if that's not your kind of thing, then maybe don't watch the end of the video. Um, but this is what it looks like now. They didn't use stitches. They actually used like a surgical glue. So on top of the incision, you can see this kind of like grayish stuff. That's glue that should fall off between two weeks and three weeks after surgery. So I'm just kind of waiting for that to fall off, but I think it looks like it's healing nicely, I wanna say. 
It doesn't look overly like bumpy or anything. So I feel like once it's healed, maybe it won't be too big of a scar. But like I said, I really, I don't mind. I don't really care too much about stuff like that. Um, might be kind of annoying to have people comment on it all the time and ask what the hell it is. <laughs> that would probably be the only reason that I don't want to have a big scar across my neck, but hopefully lots of people will watch this video and then they'll know what's up. But yeah, that's been my past three months. How have you guys been? I really hope you're having uh, a nice fall and you're enjoying fall and your life hasn't been a shit show like mine. But I will be back to Japan in two weeks from now and hopefully I'll be feeling really good and able to make videos again. I really missed you guys. I was really, really sad about all this because I was so excited about making content about my new city and exploring Sendai, but we can make that happen uh, in November when I get back to Japan. But they're gonna make me quarantine for two weeks when I get back, so I'll get back to Japan and then I'll have to quarantine for two weeks and then we can go explore. Fingers crossed, nothing else happens <laughs> in the meantime and we can actually do it this time. Honestly, if I'm ever not making videos, it's never because I don't want to. It's, it's always because something shit has happened and I'm unable to. So yeah, if you don't hear from me for a while, I'm probably just going through something and I'll be back. I really like making videos for you guys. So if something's keeping me from it, it's frustrating me as well. And I'll be back as soon as possible, trust me. Um, but yeah, I guess that's it. Um, like I said, if you have any questions for me about this experience, if I can help you out in any way, leave them down below and I'll see you guys again very soon, hopefully from Japan next time. I might make a video here in Canada. I don't know. Would you want to see that? Um, my friend Kelsey is coming to visit me from America and we're going to hang out for a bit while I'm here. So that'll be fun. Maybe we could do something together. Let me know if you'd be up for that and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Bye for now.